Hi everyone, this is a tutorial video for Psych 3470. We're on week three. We're just starting to talk about uh, reports with R Markdown. That's what that's what our textbook chapter is. We're going to be using a different kind of markdown called Quarto Markdown. And I mentioned this last class. We've already been using Quarto Markdown or QMD documents to make our blog posts. Mostly everything you'd learn about in the chapter about R Markdown will also work with Quarto Markdown, uh, but we're gonna focus on QMD documents in this tutorial. I'm gonna talk about all of this in class and put this video up here uh, for your reference. I came up with 11 different things that I want to talk about that you should know about uh, as you're learning how to use QMDs. Here's some really great links to the Quarto documentation. We'll talk about some of that stuff in this video. And really what I'm going to be doing with this video is uh, showing you how I would do the assignment for the, the blogging assignment for this week. So the blogging assignment is to basically write another post as we've been doing each week here. And uh, this time we're gonna write a post about learning to use QMD documents. And the goal that you have is to be able to do all these 11 things and use your post as a space to work on this for yourself, be able to demonstrate to yourself that you can do these things. And if you can't do them, that's okay make a note and, you know, let's talk about it in class so that you get to the point of doing all of these things. Before I start off showing you a tutorial walkthrough of this, of me doing this assignment, I'm just going to mention that in our class, we are just starting to start learning our code. We barely got into it. We've been putting our R code into the console. That's what we see here. So we've been doing stuff like this, pressing enter, writing R code, and seeing that it works. As we move forward, we're going to be putting the R code that we write into QMD documents and create uh, sections of code that get executed and the output is put into the document that we can look at later. So before we can really do that, it's important to spend some time learning more about these QMD documents. Fortunately, everything we're going to learn is going to apply to uh, things you can do with your blog posts because your blog posts are QMD documents. So let's get started. Write a blog post, and we're going to try to accomplish these 11 things. So the first one is be able to make a new QMD document. You probably already know how to do that. That's what you do when you make a blog post. I'm here in my example blog repository. I'm going to go into the posts folder. One way I could make a new post is copy an existing post. We need a folder with a name. We need the index.qmd. So I could copy this one. But what I'm going to do, I'm just going to close that. I'm going to start from scratch, make a new folder. I'm going to call this week three qmd. So there's my new folder. And I want to make a QMD document and, and save it in there. Uh, one way to make a new QMD document is go up to the plus sign, Quarto document, and give it a title. So week three QMD skills. I'll give it a name, Matt Crump, and press create. All right, so it's loaded up a document for me into the editor pane. It's in red with untitled one means I need to save this. It's not being saved anywhere. I'm going to click the save button. I'm not sure if you can see this part, but I'm navigating to my posts directory to my week three QMD directory that I just made. And I'm saving this as index.qmd. That should pop up right here. And it's the title's being renamed. So if I close it or open it, we're back to 
that file that I made. So I'm pretty sure I can do this job. I'm, I want to uh, start writing my blog post and uh, check off all these 11 boxes. If we uh, skip forward, uh, there's a few more here. Um, be able to render a QMD document. Oh, I'm actually jumping down to the bottom. Explain how the, no, I thought I added something in here that's, maybe it's not quite added yet. It will probably appear as an option tomorrow. I wanted to make a comment that tried to explain that you understand the difference between the visual editor and the source editor. It's automatically loaded me into the visual editor. I'm going to use the source editor, which shows the plain text of the document. I think we should all be using the source editor as we are learning. OK, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, um, copy all of these 11 things. And a quick way to do that off the website is just press the copy button, and I, I popped it into my document. These are the 11 goals I have. I'm going to try to accomplish them. Click off. I'm going to click off outline so you don't have to look at that right now. So, for example, I'm going to say, yes, I can do this. Uh, if I want it to be uh, you know, try even harder and, and demonstrate that I can do this multiple ways. Uh, maybe make a list here. So let's see, use the top green plus uh, bright green plus icon. Uh, how about from the file menu? And even from the file tab over here, I could have clicked this button and clicked Quarto doc, and it would make a totally blank one. That's three ways. Uh, we need to be able to demonstrate that we can render a QMD document. And we do that every time we render the blog post. So this is all super familiar, given what we've done in the course already. So for example, I could click this render button and we should see my example blog post pop up. All right, what I'm demonstrating is just kind of my process of copying over things I'm trying to accomplish slamming them into this blog post and going through each of them. I'm going to edit the text just a little bit to get, make some space here for us as I go in and do things. And for following along in the video, what I will try to do, oh, I see, I, I had this third option up here and I didn't have it down there. Okay, fine. To change that later. So there's 12 things. I'm just going to copy this in for us right now as a, another goal. Let's start there right now. Explain the difference between the source editor view and the visual editor view in RStudio. I'm not going to write that down, but I will talk about that difference. We're in the source editor view. It shows the source code as plain text. Plain text in a QMD document is interpreted as what's called markdown. That is the MD part of this. And a mark down text can be rendered into a, um, a web page or other document with some additional formatting for the text. We can see that additional formatting in the visual editor. So we click visual editor. Doesn't look that different, but for example, the little dashes I was using 
for the bullet points, they've been visually rendered as uh, little dots. And the, the one, two, three, four has been tabbed out. So the source view, how about source view shows plain text, visual editor shows rendered markdown text. That could be my answer for that one. The visual editor can be very dangerous if you are new because uh, you might think you're writing special characters that are not being written properly. If you want to know what the specific characters are, go to the source code. This will be an issue later as we start using more special characters in our R code. So let's move on to the fourth thing. Be able to insert simple markdown plain text, headers, lists, paragraphs, and render the document. Uh, that's in here. I think we've been able to do a lot of this stuff already. I've been able to insert plain text just by copying the instructions in. Um, here is a first level header. Here is a second level header. Um, this is some plain text. Let's see how that looks if I render it. And we get some dividers, bigger, bolder text for the headers, and some plain text. Be aware of resources to help you learn more about markdown options. All right. You know, I'm going to show you some resources right now, but I'm also looking at what I'm writing, and I'm finding it kind of visually difficult to separate stuff. I'm going to use these little one, two, threes one, two, three dashes. You can do more, it doesn't matter actually. But it's helping me separate out in visually in this, uh, what I've done so far. That will actually produce lines in the website like this little gray line here. Um, and that can be maybe helpful to just separate out the tasks you're doing for yourself. Be aware of resources to help you learn more about markdown options. Being aware of all these markdown options will help you be able to produce different types of outputs. And there's a link here, uh, scroll down, about general tips for writing in Quarto Markdown. So you could head over here and try out different things. Generally, what we're seeing is the source code text you need to write. This is what you need to write in the source editor. And this is what you would see in the output. And you could try this out. For example, let's copy this right over here and render it. So we're seeing, all right, all right, that's turning to italics and bold. Superscript and subscript. Let's copy that, render that. All right, so if I want to Let's, I just want to do test and I want to get a number like 10 up there. I'm, I'm seeing that I need to do two of those caret symbols just to be confident I can do that. All right, and uh, test two, a, a tilde and a number, and another tilde. Okay, that could be useful in the future. Strike through, well, this is fun. Two tildes in front and two tildes at the end, and we're gonna get a strike through in our document. How much stuff could I strike through? Two tildes and a whole bunch of text. Uh, two more tildes, whoops, let's try that. Okay, we can strike through a lot of stuff. I use this one a lot, actually. This is um, verbatim code. What does that do? It produces a little gray box, just like this. 
And uh, sometimes it's helpful to to use this. Uh, you know, uh, let's say I'm writing about the ggplot2 library. If you're talking about uh, code stuff, function names, library names, sometimes you might want to refer to it like this and have it kind of pop out. There's lots more things to learn about with your markdown option. So I encourage you to go through and read about them. Headers one to six are just the number of hashtags you put in front of anything and it will make it a header. You can add links. Here's a way to add a link directly. Two uh, left and right arrows around a URL that will make that thing clickable or just like that. This one is a different syntax. We've got the title in between two square brackets and the URL in between two parentheses. And what happens here is we get the title showing and you can click it and it links you to whatever the URL is in the parentheses. We can do images. Uh, let's try this. Copy that in. Now, this is you know important. Watch what's going to happen. It's not going to work because I don't have an elephant.png image uh, in my file in my file folder where my where this is. Um, we could. So how would we get this to work? What's happening here is uh, Quarto is looking for a file called elephant.png inside the very same folder where the index.qmd is. So there is no file here. There could be one, I suppose, if I grab this elephant and um, copied it into this folder. Uh, can I do that really fast? I mean, I let me pause this and, and make that happen. All right, I copied it in there. Uh, and, and now it should find it. So if I render this, it should be totally fine and puts the image right in there with a caption. So I could, this is an elephant. And that, that should change what the caption says. That's neat. As a matter of best practice, what I would normally do is have an images folder and put this image in the image folder. So, uh, I could move this to the images folder. Now, when I render it, it won't work again. Oh, that that's messed up. That should that seems like it shouldn't be working. I'm not sure why that's working properly. Uh, I'm confused because. Um, I don't know, maybe it's nose to look there. Uh, what I thought I would have to do is specifically list the image, uh, the images folder name in the file path here. Notice that when I did that, it does pop up. So that's, uh, I'm not sure why I was actually showing the image before. Maybe it was like a caching error. We can do lists, and you could just I mean, keep trying, copy this stuff in, and see how it how it works. This one gets you something that should look like this as an output.
Doesn't look quite right over here though, does it? I'm not sure why. Sometimes this has to do with uh, making sure you've got new lines in between things. So here's a little tip. So we're, we're noted, noting that the list didn't come out right the way that it should. And this image is on line 58. And we can see that this is on line 59 here. There's no line in between. I'm going to make a line in between by clicking this down one. So now there's a line in between. And sometimes that makes things work properly. So that was the, that was the problem. In Markdown, a great tip is have lines in between things. And other, if you don't, you might have a problem. All right, so there's some other things you could do there. You can write tables. This is pretty neat, actually. Let's copy that whole thing in here as a table. Let's see that example. I realize I could just say, you know, check out all this stuff for yourself, um, but I'm having too much fun. Let's keep going. We're actually, this, this would be a nice segue potentially to our next topic, which is being able to insert an R code chunk. Uh, but before we do that, I mean, sometimes in your document, you might want to write chunks of code uh, as a part of explaining something. And this can be done using backticks. So if you do one, two, three, and then one, two, three, that's three backticks followed by three back ticks and we can put our code in here. It prints it out in a different font. Um, if you have the name of um, a language that the code is for, it will be recognized and put a gray area around the code and allow you to copy it out. The example we see here is a uh, Python. Um, so we're seeing another example code you can copy out. Uh, I guess default maybe is one that's just kind of like random, what, what default code, whatever code. And it's not going to necessarily be colored properly. Um, just to say, like, let's say I had an algorithm that had a, multiple lines of code. Um, this is, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I'm just writing some random stuff. Uh, just to illustrate multiple lines of code. And to say that uh, this this could be treat you could treat this just as plain text or text that gets rendered out to a website that looks like this that could be useful for explaining something to somebody. There's no uh, this is a markdown ability and it it doesn't this markdown ability is uh, just for printing text to a website and not for actually running the code. Uh, it is. It is also possible to run code in a QMD document. We're going to get to that in the next pieces. A few more things to talk about. Uh, yeah, I think we're done. Let's do equations briefly. And I think I'll briefly, very briefly mention this kind of stuff. But this is an advanced topic, which I will deserves a whole nother video. So let's do equations. It's possible to print math equations, and you have to do that by doing stuff in between dollar signs. So it could be as simple as x equals 1. It could be, uh, let's see, this one here, e equals mc squared. We could grab that and put it over here, and it's going to print as math equations. Um, it renders it for you to give you a little preview, which is nice. 
click render, we should be able to see that appearing in our document as um, math equations, slightly different format for the font. There's a whole uh, LaTeX, it's called, uh, let's print it here, uh, sort of system of syntax for writing math equations. And I won't really go into that too much here. Actually, for now, I'm just gonna I'm gonna stop in terms of markdown. That was that was a lot of um, markdown options that we just learned about. There's even more, and it's quite powerful. That should be enough to demonstrate that we are aware of the resources and we've seen some of them in use here. Okay, most of the rest of this stuff. Uh, is going to do with embedding our code chunks where we can actually run our code inside of our QMD document. So let's try to do number five here. Uh, I think I meant to go this so we can see where we're at. be able to insert an R code chunk and show the output in the rendered document. All right, let's make some space for this part. So an R code chunk has a special syntax. It's again, these back ticks, it's, it's the same back ticks we were using up here and with one small difference. We're gonna have a left curly brace. And notice that as soon as I did the left curly brace, it auto-completed with a right curly brace. And we're gonna put an R in there. This thing is called an R code chunk. If you've done it correctly, you'll see a play button and some other options. We can now put our code inside of here, like a one plus one is the kind of thing we could do in the console and press return. If I press play, we're getting, we're now getting into these uh, topics, the next topics, but this is our code chunk. We can press play. It will uh, basically when we press play, it is the same as copy pasting into the console and pressing enter. And it literally does do that. If I change this to two plus two, keep an eye down here on the console. When I press play, what, what do you see? And um, the play button really, it's just an auto copy paste. It copies the code chunk into the console and executes it for you. You see the output in the console and I've got it set so that it will um, also show the output just right, right here so you can quickly see it right underneath the code chunk. You're going to be making a lot of these in this class. A lot of times you'll just be inside a QMD document and you'll want to spin up an R code chunk just like this. So that's a super fast way to do it. How did I do that? It's called a macro. And uh, the macro is... Um, I've got it like baked into my head. I can't, um, right. On a Mac, we have the option, uh, option command I. That do all, you know, hold option, hold command, hold I, and then you can quickly get the whole thing to just pop up for you. And then you can start coding inside of it. The Windows macro, I believe is, I'm gonna have to pause this and go find it. Uh, let me see. All right, according to some website on Windows, Control-Alt-I. It's going to pop one of these up for you really fast. So you should be able to go boom. And there you are. It's definitely worth learning that uh, set of key presses in order to get your 
our code chunk chunk up and running. Um, I didn't render the document yet, but when we do, what we're going to see is a few things. I just want to note them. Uh, so this our code chunk. It is being printed as a code chunk to the document. As well, it's been executed and the output has been printed to the document. This one doesn't have anything in it. I guess it didn't get printed. I'm just gonna delete that for now. Let's talk about running our code chunks in a QMD document. And there's a few different ways to do it. Pressing play, we learned about that one. So you can press play just like this. If you have some R code that you want to run, you can cop copy it and paste it into the terminal to press enter. Another way to do it is to highlight the, the code and then press uh, command enter on a Mac. So if I'm highlighting this code, I'm going to now press on my keyboard, command return, and that will execute just the highlighted code. Uh, what is the macro for that on Windows? I'm not sure. We will try to cover that in class. But very often you'll have multiple lines of code with lots of things going on, and you might want to just uh, highlight a piece of it and just run that piece. And pressing command return is a quick way to be able to do that. Okay, precedence issues. I don't have a great example right, right here to illustrate this, but as we've discussed in class, code is executed from the top down and that's the same in a QMD. When the QMD document executes all of the whole, uh, when it renders, it's going to go to the very top of the document and render code chunks all the way down from the top to the bottom. The next thing is super important being aware of our code chunk options and how to use uh, eval messages, error warning, and echo. This is a new concept I haven't really talked much about. And there is, uh, sorry, my mouse is uh, not behaving well. There is a whole section here on our code chunk options in the Quarto documentation that we can check out. So I've linked to it. I'm going to talk a little bit about it as we uh, discuss. Let's make a new R code chunk. And let's do a couple things. How about, um, I know there's a data set called MT cars. So I just clicked that. I can see this data set. Um, I happen to know that if I select with the dollar sign, the MPG uh, column, you know, that's just getting these numbers here. I could then make a histogram. These are uh, things we haven't really talked about in class yet, but I'm just giving some example code that uh, creates a figure, and you know, does some stuff. If I render this document now, we should see both the R code chunk as well as the output being printed to the document. Let's start there to talk about code chunk options. So there's a variety of options for, let's say, customizing output from these code chunks. They're listed here, and we can specify these options per 
code chunk that we have in our document, but we can also specify them up here in at a global level if we want to. This part up here is called the YAML, the YML stands for yet another markdown language. And there's document, uh, options for our document that we can declare up here. There's a lot of more options to learn about. One of the options is called the execute option. And underneath, we have to tab out, it helps us. It, if we, uh, it'll tell us what our options are that we can add. Uh, let me give you an example of adding a global option. And we'll look at the eval option. We can set it to true or false. And the eval option evaluates the code chunk. If it is set to false, it just echoes the code into the output. I set it up here at the document level, and that's going to apply to every single code chunk, in, code chunk in here. So what does that mean? Let's find out. Press render. What we should see is, here's our first code chunk. The, the, the code um, text has been outputted to the document, but the code itself has not been evaluated and the output isn't being printed. So it didn't actually run this to produce a four and it didn't show the four because it never got executed. Similarly here, uh, the histogram isn't shown because this code is just being printed. It's not being compiled. It's not being evaluated. Uh, sometimes you want to, you know, turn off the evaluation of every single code chunk in your whole document. And if you wanted to do that for all of them, you could just do it up here in one go. It's also possible to uh, set these options at the level of specific chunks. So let's say we wanted to have this chunk evaluate, even though the document says all chunks are will not evaluate. We can try to do that. There's a syntax that looks like this uh, for code chunk options. At the top of your code chunk, you're going to do a hashtag followed by a, I'm not sure what that's called actually, a bar. And now we can start writing the name of our option that we want. So we could, we would need to know that we have the eval option. Uh, does it help? Yeah, yeah, it is a bit helpful in our studio. You could do, you do uh, hashtag bar, and then I did a little space. And now I'm pressing the tab key. And actually you can see all the options that I have. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them to learn about, but we're gonna focus on these major ones. Eval here, if I set that to true. I'm declaring that I want this code chunk to evaluate. I want it to execute the code and I want the code to be output into my document. And so even though the global setting is false, the local, the chunk setting is true. And so the chunk setting takes precedence. So that's what eval does. What else do we have? Uh, let's take a look at echo. Um, I'm just gonna type echo. So what echo does is it includes the source code in the output or not. It's by default set to true, and it's referring to this uh, gray piece right here. This is the source code and it is showing up in the document. Let's say you didn't want to see this. Let's say you wanted to hide the code that produces this histogram. If you set it to false and press render, 
that code chunk piece is going to uh, disappear just like that. Okay. Um, so we talked about eval, we talked about echo. Error is probably another super important one to talk about. And uh, it tells us this will include errors in the output. Note that this implies that errors executing code will not halt the processing of the document. Let's, uh, I'll just delete that for a second. Um, I happen to know that if we write some code that is, is incorrect, like for example, let's take the letter B and add it to the number five. We can't do this. If we try to press play here, it gives us a little red area and it shows an error. The error is non-numeric argument to binary operator. So I've written some code that's gonna be a problem for R. What happens if I try to render this code? Okay, we got a problem now. When we write R code that is broken, that has a bug that throws an error, we cannot actually uh, render the output. Okay, we're getting an error. This is showing up execution halted. The website's not showing all these things. And this can be frustrating. Sometimes you want to be able to show your website and show the messed up code that's not working, right? You can do this with the error option. And I'm gonna set this to true. I'm also gonna set echo to true. And I'm gonna press render. All right. So this allowed my document to compile it shows the code uh, from this code chunk, hist, that works, it shows a histogram. And then it's showing the next piece of code here, and it's actually printing out the error for me so I can see that it's not working. And it, di and it uh, didn't hold up the whole output. Um, oh, what else do I have here? Messages, warning, these ones can be useful. Uh, I'm gonna try a new code chunk in the document. And let's load the library bplyr. If I do that, we're gonna get a whole bunch of messages. If I render this, uh, uh, oh, we're not seeing the messages in here. Not sure why. Oh, that's because I set, it didn't get evaluated. This is dangerous. I don't want to have eval false up at the top. So I'm gonna set that to true because I want all my chunks to evaluate. I'm gonna render that again. And now I'm seeing all this, all these messages from dplyr in my document. I don't want to see that because uh, it's, an, it's, you know, whatever. It's, it's a message I don't want to see. How can I turn that off? That's a chunk option. Fortunately, we have the message false. And when that chunk option is set, we should not see the message being printed to our document. It's very nice. There's, a, there's other kinds of uh, messages. Uh, there's a warning message. There's a slightly different kind of message. And you could set that to false too. Okay, so we've covered some really basic chunk options, eval, messages, error, warning, and echo. There's many more as we get further into this course, 
we'll be doing uh, lots of graphs. I'm just going to make one here. And I'm going to point out that a lot of the graphing options for how a figure is going to show up in the document are big sla uh, dash options. And let's see if I can give an example. Uh, there's, there's other options like out.width. I'm going to try this one, see if I, or taxing my memory here. Okay. Uh, I didn't set any options for how wide the figure was going to be here, but I now set it to 25% of the width of this document. So these are ways that we can be controlling all sorts of aspects of the outputs. For now, I just want you to know this is a place where you can control your R code chunks using execution options. So I think for this one, we can move on. Number eight, be able to set code chunk options per chunk and or for the whole document and understand rules for precedence. Yes. Use execute in top level YAML um, chunk options have precedence over global options. We're almost done. Number nine, write inline R code. This is a really great feature and we will use it all the time in this class in order to write reproducible reports. An inline, uh, inline R code is only one backtick followed by an R and it's closed with another backtick Here's something really simple. Uh, this is inline R code. It knows it's R code. And the, this is the R code right here, one plus one. And what's going to happen here, it's going to be evaluated as R code and the output's going to be printed to the document. So let's render this and see what we're looking at over here. So this is a fancy way to print it too. I went to the store and bought a an apple for I don't know. Could use our uh, well. Let, let, I guess let let me give maybe a slightly more interesting example. Let's say we had an R code chunk where we were having a few variables with some numbers in them. And uh, we're going to run this code chunk. When it gets run, it will these variables will be added to some environment. You can see the environment tab up here has a, a as a 54, B as a 100, C has uh, the addition of those things. Um, the value of C is, and now what I could do here is use an R code chunk, and it's going to print off the value of C for me. And write it right into the document. And this could be helpful for lots of reasons. If this code was doing something like taking a data set and analyzing a mean, uh, you could have the mean being saved in a variable and printing it out like this. And then if the data changed, maybe you collect new subjects or got new data or filtered the data, when you reran the code, the mean might be different, but it would automatically be printed out to the document, uh, whatever the new number is. All right, the last two. Well, let's see. I'm just going to keep going, even if this video is long and boring. Uh, 
trying to remember to, oh, sorry, let's get back here. Here's where we're at. Uh, we we did this, then we did this. We got these last two. We're on number 11. Number, uh, or we're on explaining how the rendering environment is different from the RStudio environment. In my experience in classes like this, this is going to be a problem because it's hard to remember what the difference is. It's kind of hard to recognize this when you're new to R. I'm going to do my best to talk about it right now. Um, and let's see, how should I do this? I'm going to pause and come up with a good example. Pause, come on. All right, I'm back. We're just going to use this example that we have staring us at the in the face. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, R Studio environment. That is this one right here. It's called the Global Environment. You can see it in the Environment tab. When I press the play button, what happened was this code got copied into the console, as you can see. We assign a 54 to the A object, a 100 to the B object, and we assign the addition of the contents of A and B to the C object. And these three are showing up in our environment with their respective contents. We can type A into the console, see that it's a 54, B, see that it's a 100, C, that it's a 154. So these are the things that are in our global environment. Whenever you run uh, our code in the console uh, that saves objects uh, or assigns information to objects, those objects will be found in the global environment. Now, this global environment that we're looking at is attached to the current instance of R that is loaded up with RStudio. You can run multiple RStudios and or multiple instances of R on your computer, and each one of them has its own global environment. When you press the render button, what happens is this document is sent to a new R process with its own global environment. And all of the code gets run anew in that new global environment. How do we demonstrate some of these things? Well, I'm going to, you probably can't see this part. I'm going up in the file menu to session, and I'm going to restart R. So I'm restarting the R session. Now my environment is empty. I've cleared it. There is no A, there is no B, and there is no C. Okay? These things don't exist in the R Studio environment. When I click the render button, The code will nevertheless work properly. We can go down to number nine, and we can see this code right here. We could see that the value of this letter C is 154. So the code got run correctly. I'd mentioned that when you press render, this document gets sent to a brand new R environment and it gets compiled over there. It's a temporary process. So very temporarily, that global environment uh, had an A and a B and a C, and those contents were printed to the document. It's a totally separate place, and it's not connected to the RStudio environment. So as you can tell, when I pressed render, it worked for the document, but notice my environment is still empty. So pressing render, 
whatever is happening in your document, it happens in a separate place and it doesn't um, get put into this environment here. Now, this next part might be a little bit confusing uh, because I'm going to do some stuff in this text editor that will show up in this RStudio environment. Um, and I'm going to try to connect back to an issue that we were talking about when we were talking about running our code chunks in a QMD document, because we're going to do that right now. I'm going to press play, and I'm going to belabor this. When I press play, this is the very same as copying this text and pasting it into this console down in the bottom and pressing enter. I mean, that, the play button literally does that for me. We can watch it happen in real time, press play. It copied that stuff in here and pressed enter for me each time. And um, now what I've, what I've done essentially is taken the text out of this document, put into the console, re rendered it in this current R our environment, and now it's showing up in my global environment. But critically, the values in this RStudio environment uh, are uh, independent from the values that get rendered when we press the render button. I, I'd like to show you some examples how. I'm going to change the number in A. All right, so I just assigned 100 to A. So we can see now clearly that A is 100, B is 100, and what is C? Well, I mean, if we reran this piece of code, because A is 100 now, B is 100 now, C should be 200 and it is, All right? So I, by hand, I changed the property of A in this RStudio environment. It didn't change B and I updated C. I, uh, so we've got these numbers here. I'm gonna click render. And the question is going to be, what value is going to show up in the output over here? Is it gonna be 154, which would respect the code that is written down in this script? Or is it going to be 200? Because that would be the sum of the A and B objects in the RStudio global environment. Now, I'll tell you right now, it's going to be 154. Press render. The document is reloaded. It is still 154. It's totally ignoring, as it should, what's in this RStudio environment. Um, it takes a while to understand this, I, I believe. So I'm just going to keep giving some weird examples. If I press play right now, what is going to happen here? You might think, well, oh, we're in this uh, text editor, and in here, it's 54 plus 100, and so A plus B is going to be 154. And uh, by the way, I could, um, I could, uh, I guess, add these numbers together, put them into a C, and then print out the C. So let's do that. So. In this text editor, remember what I'm doing when I press the play button is simply copying these things like this into the console and running them. So uh, the console doesn't know which previous code chunks you've used. All it's look, all the console knows is what's in the current R Studio environment. If we wanted to 
uh, sort of simulate the process of what's happening in the background when we press render, uh, we have to start off with a clear workspace. So I'm going to restart R again. And now if I say, click this play button, I get an error, right? That's what uh, this error is saying, object A not found. It's looking in the environment and it can't find anything because nothing's there because I cleared it. Um, this is a reminder of the role of precedence in rendering. The first things need to happen first in order for the next things to work. Um, in this case, adding together an A and a B requires that A is a defined object and B is a defined object. And I haven't done a, that, that definition inside this code chunk. It happens up here. So if I was to press this play button first, then we would get all those things defined. And now this would work again. So the rendering environment is its own separate R environment from the one that's loaded in our studio. That's my attempt at explaining it. We'll you know, go through this in class multiple times. Last, be aware of more advanced Quarto options for HTML documents and try out some of the options. Oof. This video is getting much longer than I wanted it to, to be. Uh, am I going to try this? Let, let's try it a little bit, see how far we go. Maybe, maybe I'll go on for another 20 minutes um, or not. Uh, maybe let's make another video to go into more detail. But here's the last one. Be aware of more advanced Quarto options. So I'm linking to making an HTML document from the Quarto guide. We can click that. And here we can learn about a whole bunch more stuff that we can add in our Quarto documents. Let's check it out. We're seeing a little bit up front uh, some new things inside of the YAML. Uh, let's go to the top and see what we can add here. Format HTML TOC. Let's try that. And grab all this stuff. Add it right here. So this is a format option. It's an HTML document. I'm setting TOC to true. That is short for the table of contents option. And TOC depth. Set to two, sure, why not? What is this gonna happen? What's gonna happen here if we do this? This is an option that I have enabled for the course website. And if I can make this bigger, let's look, let's see if I can, all right. What's happening is on the right side, we are getting a uh, little table of contents for whatever headers there are in the document. So before I tried to make some headers, the first level, second level, and they're showing up here. Um, this is actually super useful for making documents look nice. Uh, how about this? Um, uh, make new QMDs. That's a nice header. Render QMDs. Uh, simple markdown. Markdown resources, and so on. I'm just adding more descriptive headers throughout my blog. And let's see what happens if I render that. This is easier to read. And all those headers are showing up here. And 
it makes it easier to navigate through your document. So setting up a TOC can be really helpful uh, when you're blogging. What else do we have? Uh, I guess you can set the title of this thing. Uh, on uh, the title here is on this page. Maybe change that uh, to contents. Is that? I never tried this. Let's see what happens. Yay, we got contents done. If you want to exclude a heading from the table of contents, add both the unnumbered and unlisted classes to it. Okay. So let's say I don't want this markdown resources, or I don't want simple markdown to appear at all. Grab these things, pop them over here. Um, this, in fact, is adding what's called a CSS class to this header, and it's going to make it disappear over here, I believe. All right, so that one zap that out. Section numbering. Right now, we don't have any section numbering, but we could have section numbering if we wanted. I'm, guess, I'm guessing that it goes in here, underneath, still underneath all of these things. Uh, this is one of the oddities about going through and trying to figure out the Quarto documentation. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do with this thing? All right, so it added uh, one, two, three, and so on. If you have subheadings, like a second letter, level header, and uh, let's, I guess we try that. So number depth, that's, oops, what am I doing? Uh, second level. I think that that's going to be given a two point something. Yeah, three point, or so three is marked on resources, so 3.1 and, and stuff like that. So there's a lot more options here that you could check out. I think I'm going to stop there for now and come back at some point with a longer. Uh, video on uh, yeah just customizing all these things that you can customize all right that's uh, what i would do for my week three qmd skills blog i've rendered it uh, i need to go to github desktop make a commit message commit my changes and push it and we should be able to see this appearing on on the example blog. See you next time.